It's Wednesday. Let's chat. Hi, I'm Kanan Chandra, the publisher of StormAsia.com, and welcome to our web web chat, the series of discussions on topical <coughs> issues. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to let you know you can uh, there's a question and answer box and a chat box for you to ask questions of our panelists uh, on today's topic, uh, which is something which came up in budget uh, 2023 uh, by Finance Minister Lawrence Wong the new era of global development. Now, what does that mean? That's one of the things we want to uh, get into uh, as we go through this session. But um, during the speech, uh, 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 the minister said that uh, we cannot assume that we can continue to be successful by doing the same things as we have in the past. We will need to adjust to this new era reposition our economy and refresh our social compact for the future. Um, therefore, we will need to redouble our efforts to attract high quality investments, uh, and we will need to focus on broad sectors where we can be highly competitive. Um, so in broad strokes, these are what many would call motherhood statements that have been repurposed for uh, this era. Uh, these are always things that we strive for. We want to do better. We want to be relevant. Uh, we want to have the investments coming in because we, we, as a small nation, are very reliant on that. Now, how do we do that? Uh, when everything is changing around the geopolitical situation, uh, the way people and countries are behaving, how do we step onto this platform and make a difference or make ourselves be seen and heard? Now, today's panelists uh, are going to get into that uh, discussion with me. Uh, we've got uh, Nick Go, who is the co-founder and head of strategy at Black Bad Digital. He's got loads of experience in branding, advertising, and marketing with local and international brands. Uh, welcome, Nick. Um, we've also got uh, Kuswi Young, who is the director of uh, International Property Advisor. Uh, he's an author on the property scene. Uh, he's got, uh, I don't know how many books I've run, out of the number of books that he's run, six or seven, maybe he's 12 by now, I don't <clears> know. <throat> he's also a realtor, a lecturer, and a commentator on a lot of issues that are taking place in society today. Uh, welcome, Nick and Suiyong, to today's discussion. Um, how would you define this new era of global development? I mean, what comes to mind when you see that? Uh, let's start with you, Nick. Well, uh, Karan, first of all, thank you so much for having me uh, on your on your web web chat. Uh, looking at the, the the speech that was given, and I think looking at the context as well, I think uh, there's a phrase I like to bring up. Right, the phrase is actually by Albert Einstein. It says that in the, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And I think that's the 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 the, the story of our times right now. Uh, I mean, you have a, an environment uh, that's less hospitable, uh, less open, or rules-based multilateral system, more insular, rising regional conflicts. Uh, and as a result, you know, you have supply chain issues and or concerns about that, right? Uh, you have uh, maybe even job mobility issues as well. Uh, but the point is that in every crisis, then lies great opportunity, right? So uh, so for me, the way I see global development and, and what I would like to talk about, or at least share my perspective on, uh, is on the micro and not the macro level, uh, from a business perspective or from a, from a digital capo perspective, so to speak, if you will, you know, uh, that's my take, yeah. There are fair few quotes floating around about, you know, from sure. Einstein or whoever. Uh, I wonder whether you need to perhaps bring into perspective because he was speaking at a time when there was a lot more, uh, well, there were a lot less regulations, there was very little globalization, uh, and things moved at a much slower pace. Here in today's context, we've got uh, globalization, we've got uh, disruptions, we've got changes taking place which do not give you enough time to even think about it and react sometimes before you're on to the next disruption. So I don't know. I'm sure that it, as a general principle, prices uh, and opportunities, uh, they sort of go in hand in hand, but you really yeah. need to understand uh, 
uh, what the lay of the land is, and that's very tricky in today's uh, time, right? In today's oh, well, sort of environment. I mean, kind of, you're right in saying that. At the same time, as well, I can't help but you know uh, have this buzzword in my head as you mentioned that uh, it's all about relativity, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and at a point where he. he uh, that quote was actually uh, coined by him. Uh, I think times, yes, you're right, it's different. But then again, at that, at that moment in time, it was probably a, a pressing concern for the populace at that, at, uh, at that moment in time as well. So I think, you know, uh, we've got to see things in the in the context that we're in, right? And I, I think that's that's important. And I think one of the areas that, uh, that I understand that uh, again, you go back to the, the topic that that uh, that you want us to have a chat on. Uh, it's about the looking at what are the areas that I guess you know um, a more global development approach could actually alleviate or address some of the pressing concerns that uh, that our society is facing. Am I right? Mm. More or less, mm. right? So I think. And you look at that, it's, it's, it would probably revolve around, uh, you know, uh, the issues of uh, income distribution, look at the issues of also uh, uh, employment or the worries of, of, of unemployment or the, 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 the displacement of jobs as a result of, uh, you know, the tech disruption or the possible tech disruption or that, that overhanging or overarching worry that, uh, that a lot of commentators tend to talk about. But but then again, is that is that really true? You know, is that a, a real cause for concern? You see, you know, uh, because where, wherever there are naysayers, there will also be a, a bunch of uh, or commentators that say that there are actually real opportunities, right? Hmm. Uh, okay. But I think, but yeah, but uh, before I carry on and then you know just talk too much, but but please, uh, you know, okay. stop me, save no, me no, for myself. We'll we'll, you know? we'll, uh, we'll get into all of this, but I thought I'll let uh, Sui Yong. Uh, Yes. Uh, introduce himself and uh, tell us what he thinks of uh, this uh, new era of global development. So, yeah, over to you. When I first saw the news um, article with the headlines uh, saying that the minister has uh, is saying this thing about the new era of global development, I was totally confused. What's the meaning of this new era? And then what global development? Um, because I have been dealing in cross-border type of uh, real estate transactions in uh, at least in the past 15 years is either I going out of Singapore to sell Singapore properties or I am in Singapore selling some other countries' properties. So um, then this thing about new era, it, usually historians will look back at a certain period and then organize the time periods and then classify them according to era. So before you step into something while you're still in the present looking into the future, it is difficult for you to declare something an era unless a minister is actually referring to perhaps um, what the astrologists on the Chinese zodiacs uh, astrology site, maybe is the changing of period eight to period nine sort of new era versus the Western astrology is talking about changing from the earth to the air era. And in, in fact, that's the point that I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in. Is minister hinting that there is this change of earth era to air era, but because in parliament, he cannot bring up astrology to back up his points, right? But um, there have been uh, seminars given by astrologists talking about this change because we've gone from a very hard physical manufacturing, transportation, uh, hardware, real estate construction type of a world to a world where we are now, uh, everything is in the clouds. Everything is in your mobile phone, is on your, is, is an app. Um, and we now are leaning a lot more on software and services rather than on ownership and, and materialism. So you pay for transport uh, as a service. You can pay for uh, a product as a service instead of buying and owning the product. So that transition into a new era where we have got to change the way we live as well as change our wardrobe and change the stuff in our storeroom I think that that part is a, a, a real change and we are shifting to a new era in that sense. But on the point about new era of global development, that part I'm unclear about his definition. Actually, yeah. I see um, 
Uh, uh, Su Young, the, the point you raised about the about the global development or the new era, right? And, and what you just mentioned about the services being on the cloud and also the, the digitization of, of services. I think that is, uh, if you if you ask me from my point of view, I would see that as one of the same actually, because that is actually what we're, we're, we're facing. We're facing a, a, a new change in terms of how things are being done, you see. Uh, if we take a look at the uh, loosely coined era before COVID and the era, in what is coming to be a next phase of COVID, uh, there are clear difference, differences in terms of how things are, are, are being looked at, right? And at, at the same time, it's not just only a post or next phase of COVID, but you also have you know, the war in Ukraine as well. And then you have tensions rising in different parts of the regions too, which then further cement this idea that there is an era that we need to be concerned about, you see, at least a moving into another phase, right? So I think that's how I would see it, you know. Um, but kind of, what do you think? I think we are constantly moving, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's the nature of of the world these days. We have very little time to sit down and take stock. We could do that maybe just a few decades ago when things were sort of ramping up. But in that process, there was time to evaluate. Now yeah. it's just so quick. You have very little time. So how quickly can we react to things? Right. So is the new era, one that is constantly shifting. You know, yes. it's, it's just a whole lot of new things that are happening. Um, but, you know, the the problem here would then, I, as I would see it, would be how do we identify where we get stuck into something and go for it? Because mm -hmm. if that's shifting, you know, and we are constantly shifting our focus, we're just going to be unable to, to latch on to anything and make it work, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. do we then need to settle something so that at least people understand and have a clearer picture of what's going on? So on that point, my guess was that, um, yes, supply chains have been disrupted a few times uh, in the last three years, especially because of the pandemic. And then we have seen how the wars as well as um, regional politics have made some countries uh, a lot more inward looking and deciding to say close their borders or impose tariffs. But technology is also playing a part in some of these things. For example, um, just 3D printing, uh, it could disrupt Singapore's 100 uh, year old transshipment, 200 years old transshipment industry. We are a trade center, we are a, a port that has got to bring things in from long distance and then maybe repackage them and ship them out on short distance or vice versa. But with the advent of 3D printing, the manufacturing model and the supply chain model could be turned around where you do not need to have a factory that prints out, uh, that manufactures a million pieces of garment a month anymore. If it could be 3D printed at close to where the consumption is, then there isn't a need for giant factories, giant distribution centers, and then shipping through the different ports, and then finally getting it into the hands of the consumer. If the entire supply chain were turned around because of new technology, then yes, uh, I would then say Singapore better rewire its infrastructure in order to get ourselves ready for this, because building another twice mega port might not be the way to go to capture that new business. Hmm. There's also the factor of uh, increasing personalization, right? I mean, if that is allowable, then the whole idea of mass production will slowly have, or well, maybe not even slowly, will have to be rethought uh, and reconfigured. So where do you see the opportunities then uh, in the way the things are shaping up post-pandemic? And given what's been happening, Nick? given that I'm in the already in the professional services sector, I mean, I, I earn my revenue from brokerage fees and from consulting fees, right? Um, in fact, in the past 10, 10 years already, since the last our national conversation, and beyond that, we have got specific industry transformation maps, and I participated in some of these things. We, we've for SMEs uh, like mine, I've always been saying, can, can we let on to the, to the big trucks, our Singapore, 
Singapore big companies, when they go overseas, buy a piece of land to develop an industrial township, for example, could they let us tag along and provide some of the consulting services, maybe provide some valuation or engineering sketches and design elements so that we earn a fee from the success of Singapore's efforts to globalize our own large companies, our own homegrown MNCs. Um, unfortunately, that uh, hasn't taken place. Many of our large MNCs going overseas tend to employ local good brand uh, say architects, uh, engineering consultants, and, and, and then we are left at home. And at home, we find it difficult to compete against the international brands that we've opened our doors to welcome them to come to Singapore. Hey, this is an open playing field. We are international uh, economy, so please come in here. So how would we then ever grow our own consulting and real estate uh, brands up to be able to go out there and, and, and compete in the, this new era of global development if we are not given the opportunities and at home we are contesting in a very high, increasingly high cost and shrinking market type of an environment. Doesn't the, the idea of you know, competition and cream rising to the top have a part to play in this? I mean, if you're really good, uh, your services will be sought after, right? Uh, regardless of where you are. I mean, it's, it's uh, such a connected world these days. You don't even need to be physically anywhere to, to deliver certain services. Uh, but wouldn't that be the case? I mean, the question yes. that could be asked is, are we good enough? Are we of an international caliber enough to fight in that space? Yes, you are correct. Except that maybe we, as a new SME, I mean, my company is uh, less than 20 years old um, and we are up against um, big name consulting firms that are 50 to 100 years old coming in with lots more capital to be able to play in this market plus their established base of being international already. Um, yeah, uh, of course, we can't compete. Nick, you've worked with yeah. many of the big brands as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, on what uh, Suyong just said? Well, I, you... I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, uh, wade into the, the area that Suyong just shared. I mean, uh, about the local boys competing with MNCs, right? Uh, I think that's going to be a regular uh, tension point uh, in any country, right? Uh, but I think what I'm more concerned about is coming back down to this idea of global development and how that could impact the lives of Singaporeans, right? Uh, so, uh, and I think uh, I think I shared early on uh, with you, kind of about how um, the uh, the role of of, the, of senior citizens, for example, right? Uh, can they be? Can they still find uh, purpose in their lives even in their civil years? And if, should they still want to work as well? Right. So for those who still want to work, are there opportunities for them? And what are those opportunities for them? Would it be a form of you know working with AI uh, using a form of collaborative intelligence, right? Uh, where uh, the the uh, the civil generation individuals who still want to work have got the skill set that can still be harnessed and deployed, right? And is that an opportunity to address uh, things where you know? Uh, I think if I quote from or I've taken from the uh, the speech, looking after a growing number of seniors, not just for their medical or, or, and retirement needs, but also for their care and living arrangements. So it's about quality of life, I guess, right? If I were to take it in context. So what 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 are the opportunities of or the quality of life could one have if they want to actually lead a healthy retirement life? And and by by the way, retirement doesn't have to mean I don't need to work. It's, as long as I enjoy doing what I want to do, right? Yeah. So yeah. an idea to 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 throw out here would be, for example, uh, drone pilots, for example. Just, just for, the, for the sheer fun of the conversation, right? Okay, uh, sure, go for it. Yeah. Would it be possible? Would it be possible to 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 have uh, people who are in the civil years still having good motor capability and mental faculties be able to be drone pilots that could be used in different parts of uh, of of society? 
whether for emergency services or for you know or for civil defense or, or for something that would that we've seen being used rather effectively in a certain part of the world where they're fighting a war, you know. Uh, building maintenance. There you go, building maintenance. Yeah. Oh. Drone security. for building survey, yes. Security as well. Security yeah. for condos, right? Yeah. yeah. So so you don't so, really need to be again, uh, because you're not so some individuals who are really on the older side, they don't need to walk a lot. They can just be trained to know how to monitor and use the uh, the device to actually you know augment the the physical stuff that that can actually you know uh, do the other more manual based work you know. Yeah, so I think uh, yes, there is certainly a role that the civil generation wants to play as well in society. Um, uh, there are opportunities, maybe, but you know when it comes to the crunch. Um, how do companies uh, decide who they're going to pick? Um, quite often, they'll pick the younger people, those who are skilled, those who are up and coming, because they are eager, they are at, you know they are natives to whatever environment you're trying to come into, and they're probably a bit cheaper. Older, you come with, uh, you know, you have experience, but is experience relevant anymore? Yeah. Uh, and do you, you know, then they'll probably want more, but... Uh, then they might have to take more time to go for medical leave. So I'm not, I'm not saying that they shouldn't, they should try, but it's an attitude of You're right. companies You're right. towards the hiring process, right? I think it's, it's not they just... even get a chance to be, to go anywhere near a drone, let alone be a drone pilot? So so some, some individuals may be already drone pilots. So they can actually be, you know, uh, they can continue that, that so-called, uh, uh, that career or the hobby into a career in, in retirement. Then on, on your point about what if someone wants to learn to be a drone pilot, has no skills whatsoever, is in a civil generation, but wants to actually you know, give a shot at having that kind of a, a retirement job close to the commerce. And I think the, the, the worries about ageism, about, uh, about uh, social bias towards that, I think that's a concern. I, I agree with you, but I think those, those will probably need to be addressed if we go into since we're going to have more and more individuals or 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 uh um in, who are going to be in that category of being in the in the senior citizens category, I think that needs to be addressed because we are definitely you know um not we but rather the senior citizens would have a role to play for sure you know particularly if you have sound mental faculties and and sound motor abilities as well. Yeah, one of the the discussions I had with somebody from an agency trying to. Uh, get more seniors onto the digital platform. Mm. Uh, they would they they wanted to find out how they could get uh, seniors, the silvers, to be uh, more digital savvy, right? Uh, so they set up a website. So the question was, if they are not digital savvy, are they going to go to a website? Uh, yeah. Right. So it's a chicken and egg situation to some extent, but. Uh, I was thinking, look, if you want to, there is this whole generation of people who could be digital savvy. Look, you're forcing things upon seniors as well. Banking is now digital. Uh, you know, you had to have your, your trace together. Of course, there were tokens and so on, and so on but you're increasingly pushing people towards digital. Mm -hmm. And then there's this group of uh, seniors or silvers who don't have the digital capability. They don't have the phones to start off with. So instead of giving out this, uh, you know, regular money, you know, bits of money to go and look care of your, take care of your household needs, how about giving X amount of dollars or giving a phone to the senior so that they have the tool to work with to start off with, and they can maybe learn from that. Mm. You know, so uh, I don't know whether something like that should take place. I mean, we've been giving things out to many different sectors, so why not uh, give the tool? So that this group of people can actually learn how to plug into the digital right. environment. I mean, kind of that, that's an interesting point, right? Uh, uh, but I, I would tend to look at the issue of purpose, right? So if the senior citizen would have a purpose uh, to use digital because he or she sees the need to maybe enrich or enhance one's life, then that individual would likely be motivated to learn how to do it. You see. 
Right. So I think the question of purpose again was, but you, 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 I would know that. But if you can't some... afford it, if you can't afford it, then the purpose doesn't uh -huh. come into play at all, right? Yes. And then the access, so, access to that as well would be important. No, I agree with you. Yes. So access so to. It is but, access. Yeah, it is access and the ability, but we should look at it from the point of helping to lower the cost and lower the hurdle of the access rather than giving the voucher or giving the tool because same as in our public housing now giving additional grants to help people buy you will just make the resale flats more expensive and we have seen that in the last 10 years already where um, the minimum household income ceiling has been pushed up to buy BTOs and the more you push up the household income to allow more people that affordability, the more prices go up such that those who don't qualify are really priced out of the game in a very short time. So instead of giving and that, back to my point about helping SMEs do better, right. it is not to give a grant to the SME. I've already used the PIC to buy myself a laptop. Buying mm. myself the most cutting edge laptop wouldn't allow me to do my job any better now. I am hoping to see cost reduction and simplification, for example, of policies, uh, simplification of um, procedures. Um, a, a few years ago, for example, when I applied to renew a license, I've got to submit my license renewal together with a freshly printed ACRA report of my company's shareholdings. This, I mean, it, I'm applying for a license renewal with a government agency that could have gotten its sister government agency, ACRA, the, in, the latest information, but instead I've got to go to ACRA, buy myself a fresh report that is within two months uh, of the license application and submit it together. This type of things for, for SMEs is a few dollars more, but the few dollars more adds up. So if we could also help Older people, instead of giving more grants on healthcare or topping up the MediSafe and all, let's make it cheaper for them. I, I was going to suggest that as part of the push for services uh, industry workers, let's produce a lot, a lot of healthcare workers, um, physiotherapists, nurses, uh, caregivers. Let's produce a lot of them such that just like 30 years ago, Singapore was exporting our project engineers. We were exporting accountants and auditors to other countries who were short of that talent. Let's overproduce medically trained and healthcare trained people. And then if we happen to over our, oversupply our own market and keep our costs reasonably nice and low, we can then export our talent overseas and help the rest of the developing countries who are short of medical workers. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I'm just only really concerned about the, the social replica, uh, reper, repercussions if you have too many uh, uh, healthcare professionals that may not be wanted in Singapore and whether or not so we export them. Be, but, but, would export they want them. Be, but, but the thing is that would they like to be, uh, would they like to live abroad as well? Or would they prefer All to OECD countries are short of medical care and they pay better. Why not? But, I mean, we were case, exporting engineers to the Middle East. Yeah. But in any case, my, my, the, the point I want to actually raise is, is, uh, is actually about, uh, uh, I think currently you mentioned about the, uh, about how are you going to train these individuals, right? I mentioned about the, uh, the, uh, the drone pilots, for example. And I think if I, if I were to just extend that, that, uh, the idea, uh, take for example, you know, Air Force pilots. Okay, it will come an age uh, 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 where their shelf life will be have to will go into retirement, and to train an air force pilot, or even train an airline pilot, is a lot of money. So how then do you uh, still keep that skill set, uh, and have that individual transfer that skill set to others? All right, and we're talking about technological innovation as well. I think that's one of the points raised in global development too. Right. And I think if there's a possibility, and this is just a far-fetched idea, but I'm just going to try it out anyway, just for, for, for our discussion. Sure, right? Why not? Uh, um, a lot of this is all theoretical as well. So. Exactly. It's just <laughs> for the fun of it. Right. So, so for example, if you look at how airline pilots 
would have a co-pilot. And then we had the, we had the sad situation of MH370, right? And that uh, whatever happened, the, the transponder was turned off. What if in the near future, there would be a remote pilot, right? They can actually take control as and when something happens on board the actual plane. Of course, you can't have a plane without a pilot. I think passengers wouldn't want to board a plane of that nature. Okay, right? But the point is that there is always going to be eyes on the ground, uh, monitoring planes and being able to take over when necessary. And those individuals are trained pilots. Could that be the same yeah. as well for our Air Force as well, right? Yeah. And also for drone, uh, uh, not just for the uh, higher price uh, 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 warplanes, but rather it could also be a case of retraining our pilots to be more effective in drone strategy or drone warfare, right? Okay. But these so, are things, uh, just a point of just to throw out, yeah. basically. Okay. Yeah, uh, you, know, you, you were saying something about... Um, passengers not wanting to board a plane without a pilot. Now, if we get comfortable with autonomous vehicles where you don't have a driver for your car, that will spread itself into a bigger picture and people may be fine getting on board the plane. Now, when you board a plane, how many of you actually go say hi to the pilot? No, but yeah, you, right? you kind of know there's a, <laughs> a person there, right? <laughs> but I think I think what would be a strong selling point from a marketing perspective is that if I know that a plane has got a, a, a safety feature, yeah. that will be a good selling point, right? It's not just a human being, but it's also another human being down on the ground to to to, to play with to play redundancy. You see, you know, uh, I think that will be I'll be more assured that way. You know, actually, uh, the technology is there. Really. Um, 1995, I was working in our airline here um, and placing aircraft orders to feasibility studies and all. The technology is actually right. okay for no pilots to be in the cabin, uh, including takeoff landing. It's right. just that good. you have got to have good weather. I mean, any inclement weather, then you have to have a steady hand to take charge. Right. Yes. Exactly. Because I think but of course, you, your steady hand could actually be on the ground rather than being in the cockpit. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I, 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 I think the, uh, the, the, the issue is about, uh, I think back to Kanan's point about, you know, will it, will it come a point where people are com comfortable with no one, no pilot being or piloting the plane? I think that will take a while because if you have a, uh, uh, you sit in, in an autonomous vehicle on, the, on land, there yeah. will probably be a safety feature for you to stop the vehicle. Yeah. We can't do that in a minute unless you want to give every passenger a uh, you know a parachute and with an oxygen mask as well, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's we have that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So okay, let's uh, I, I was just thinking uh, uh, talking wanted to talk about the whole idea. Uh, you've, you've spoken a lot about the aging population, but we've also got a uh, low fertility rate. Uh Suyong right. shared with me the other day that at some point we might have more deaths than births in Singapore. Um right. Um, By so, around 2030. Uh, that's okay. quite soon, actually. So what's that going to do? I mean, where's the future talent uh, for Singapore and this new era going to come from? Any mm. thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I, I mean, would... Well, sorry, so young, go Nick, ahead. Nick, yeah, I, go, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I would prefer if we could recognize this point and accept it. Uh, and therefore gear our economy up for a lot more high value, but low labor, uh, low headcount requirement type of jobs in recognition of the fact that we will have a population that will shrink rather than wishing to grow the population such that you can increase consumption, recognize that pushing additional consumption is really an old era global development. The new era being, we could possibly have a total population instead of 5.6 million, maybe shrinking back down to 3.0 million, but with a GDP that is even higher than today's. So you go for all the really high skill, high tech, um, very high productivity type of work, gear our economy towards that and with a lot of a lot more brain power, everything else we outsource into the clouds if where possible. Uh, 
including maybe we could outsource government services into the clouds. But I think once we understand what are the areas that are lacking, and those areas that are lacking are important for our e economy to be more global uh, and to contribute more to a global to a globalized economy. I think that would be an area that we want to focus on. And then at the same time, the education would then have to support the development of talent in that area. Is it you know? Uh, that's, I mean, that just seems to be a logical way of, of looking at it. Where do we get the, uh, the youth to actually, you know, be able to, to staff jobs of the future? And would that projection be uh, healthy enough to be sustainable in the long term? That's also another question as well. So, um, do it is a, it's, it's a tough one, you know? Um, so I would, I would salute those in power and, uh, uh, at least I'm not going it, to be. It's an it's yeah it's you know, an unenviable job because it is uh, very, yeah. we are small. We uh, you know uh, speaking to uh, some other people, the, the main concern has always been about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. you know, Singapore is just subject to so many different uh, storms that could come from anywhere, um, and we don't have a seat at the big boys table. We may be no. strong and big in certain respects in finance and those industries, but we still don't have a seat at the big boys' table. And so we are at the mercy of whatever they decide sometimes. So uh, what would you think are the key sort of uh, attributes to have when you are trying to uh, navigate a new sort of era? Well, okay, for one, we're better new era, but uh, what comes ahead? You know, the uncertainties. Right. I think if I may just uh, wait in first and then Su Young, you can shoot it down. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I I think one of the areas would probably be, you know, um, the, the new digital economy, so to speak, right? And I'm not referring to the definitions of, of the past. I'm actually referring more towards like the metaverse, okay? Uh, or Web 3.0. And I'm actually, uh, and it's actually a very great and exciting area right now. Uh, I think there are opportunities, but the opportunities are also very uh, great as well, right? Because it's it's almost like a, car, a cowboy kind of territory as well. But you have brands that are actually doing well. I mean, for example, uh, Nike's, Nike rolled out Nike Land back in November of 2021. And uh, what was uh, supposedly an experiment is now still carrying on because Nike's digital strategy uh, have actually contributed to 26% of its, of its uh, total uh, brand value, of, of its total revenue value, sorry. Uh, and the metaverse uh, engagement is actually part of that digital strategy. Uh, so you have actually things that are working for, for some brands because they, they know how to actually make use of a medium like the, like the metaverse. In this case, it's Roblox, basically. So the question is this, is there an opportunity for people in the, in the populace to be able to partake in a economy in the metaverse and to, to benefit from it? Both ways, consumers and also corporates as well, right? Yeah. Uh, are there... Certain okay. industries that are more suited towards the metaverse and those sort of uh, new digital areas that we're looking at. So right now, it seems to be more of the those who have a gamified uh, uh, um, approach. So more, so if you are, if you have a game or you have some sort of gamified uh, 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 environment uh, where people are able to to do uh, an activity uh, akin to a game. Uh, that would be more likely to succeed than one that's just strictly based on, oh, let's get together and let's, and let's uh, socialize. I think that tends to fail. In fact, I think uh, there was a local brand that had a rather cutesy uh, metaverse experience and very cute characters, but it, it flopped. I can't remember the brand name though, but uh, but since it flopped, it's not really nice to mention it here. Yeah. Uh, so why did it flop? Just QC. Just, uh, there's no there's no reason to believe. There's no purpose behind it. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, sorry, as young, go ahead. Yes, yes. I am totally in support of the going going big into the metaverse. Unfortunately, we are a bit early days as to yeah. which metaverse platforms, and it would take quite a bit of investment and and such large scale investments into. I I would consider metaverse as an infrastructure. So 
if it is an infrastructure, it's a platform, we need uh, investments that come from uh, government plus uh, risk, risk money. But you see, uh, the example of having uh, drones being flown from the ground, and if the drone were a 747 aircraft, meaning the pilot and the co-pilot would lose their jobs. Uh, yeah. Autonomous vehicles um, may cause a lot of drivers or even the traffic policemen could lose their job. The traffic auntie would lose her job because autonomous vehicles would not flout the rules by parking any old how, right? So mm -hmm. when people lose their jobs and it is difficult to find meaningful, very high skill jobs for them anymore, they become consumers in the metaverse. They consume content. And other than the two constituents that Nick mentioned, which is um, the... The, the brands that are going on it and, and the, the metaverse uh, technology providers. We Another group, uh, sorry, the, the consumers plus the technology people, the other group is the content maker. And you mm -hmm. could then gear some of our, in, in future, you wouldn't just be the older person losing his job. The car mechanic with fewer car parts in the electric vehicle, we need fewer car mechanics anyway. But even the 30-year-old car mechanic could find that, hey, my, I'm, I'm no more engine gearbox for me to fix. I lost my job. He can become a content creator, putting on content on culture, history, cooking, uh, stitching, sewing uh, on Metaverse. So we will have a platform that has got to be somehow find the investment to make it steady and usable. That's infrastructure. We'll have the consumers. And then we have these new jobs of people who are creating content and providing services in the metaverse and yeah. everybody would be paid a little bit for for their content. so so if you look at it i think uh so young i think you you actually uh, touched one area which is very important which is about uh the content creation right so if you look at the metaverse there are basically two uh, there are three broad areas and so one is the the centralized based metaverse like for example horizon walls owned by meta then you've got uh, Roblox as well, you saw my uh, uh, Roblox Corporation, right? Decentralized. Then, decentralized. So, so decentralized yeah. will be the decentralized base where it's owned by users and owned by com and run by communities, similar to Sandbox as well, right? Then you got Roblox. the gaming. I uh, then you got Spatial as well, right? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, but Spatial is more of a of a, of a centralized metaverse because it's actually run by a, 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 by a company. You don't own land. So when you can actually own land, you tend to have a decentralized base metaverse, you see, because then you can create content, you can put your own stuff, but then you could you have to abide by community guidelines. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the 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 area that is very exciting right now for the metaverse developments are the gamers or the gaming platforms, like for example, Sony PlayStation, right? Uh, for example, Fortnite, right? Uh, Xbox. All these all these environments are actually moving more towards trying to tap into the gaming metaverse experience. And you talk about content creation, yes. You talk about uh, having uh, uh, support to support of individuals to, to be in that industry, in that ecosystem, to be able to play a supportive role as well. It's also going to be quite exciting, you know. Uh, and then yes. you're going to have what the, the, the potential of having non-player characters, uh, you know, being very pervasive in the in the traditional metaverse, which is like what I mentioned, the centralized or decentralized based metaverse. And how would that be managed and would that require a collaborative intelligence uh, management of it? So a human getting involved in it, right? Uh, so it's actually going to be quite exciting. Then you have the Apple and, and Microsoft looking into the HoloLens, the AR, MR uh, glasses approach where you interact with we, we, we interact with a hybridized world, right? So you yeah. use the real world with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, augmented with a platform. And that will also be a different kind of, you know, engagement altogether. But the point to note is that it's going to be exciting. That's for sure. Yes. Right. You know, I'm uh, going to go inside there and register a political party and start to get people to vote, man. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so uh, <laughs> I want to, all the best to you. <laughs> Look, there's so many opportunities in all of this. But, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, Nick, as you were going through that, many of the names are big names. Um, how would an individual with a smart idea be able to get into that space without being totally flattened out or have the idea stolen? Would you need new sets of rules to 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 sort of uh, well, for want of a better word, control this uh, environment? 
So, I mean, give me an example, right? You 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 can go and uh, work with with uh, uh, with some individuals, like many individuals. You can start up. You can get a parcel of land or parcels of land on uh, in in decentralized, and then you can you can create a district out of that area, right? Like in decentralized, there's a district called Dragon City, and Dragon City is about people who who love Chinese culture. They get together and they just propagate Chinese culture. So you can do something based on whatever your uh, your heart's content or your passion lies, and that that could be uh, it could be a business idea or it could be something just totally social, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is that uh, it's it depends on which type of metaverse you want to go into. If you're going to go into the more centralized, then it will cost a lot more money because then you're going to work with the likes of Meta to get yourself into that into that metaverse environment. You see, right? I can uh, see this sort of becoming quite big down the line because a lot more natives will be in that space. But I think for a lot of the silvers now, this is gobbledygook. What is going on? Yeah. We don't even know how to use our mobile phones properly, uh, let alone the metaverse, right? So, um, so, so I think the awareness. Point. So I would say that it's, it's important to have that awareness right now that there are these opportunities, right? And I mean, look, Siyong is quite excited as well, right? And I, I'm sure... Yeah, uh, Siyong's not that old. <laughs> he's still a young chap. He's a, yeah, but no, I'm not saying that he's old. I'm just saying that, uh, that you know, we are all excited. And that's important. And I think there will also be a lot of like-minded individuals excited as well about the opportunities that that uh, the metaverse provides. And for for example, even the recent uh, phenomenon of, of chat GBT, chat GBT can also be integrated in the metaverse because it can you can create non-player characters in the metaverse and they could be infused with chat GBT AI, right? So, so you interact with a non-player character, you will get a response. You know, so my point, and then how do you manage that response? Because sometimes maybe the response is not right. Then you have a collaborative intelligence with a human behind that. So there, there could be layers of opportunities for humans and also technology. But as what Suyong also rightly pointed out, then there needs to be an ecosystem, a creation of an infrastructure, you see. And could that infrastructure creation be part and parcel of having our seniors, having our displaced individuals or workers having an opportunity in this new environment or this new ecosystem? Yeah. Okay. Great. Gentlemen, it's uh, it's past one thirty. Thank you. Oh, okay. uh, I just <laughs> I just wanted to uh, get maybe one last view from each of you about uh, where you see uh, this new area of global development, and do you are you optimistic, pessimistic, or indifferent towards it? Uh, let's start with you, Nick. Well, it all depends on what happens in certain parts of the world. So I'm on the fence right now. You know. Uh, I'm not. I don't have a bunker right now, but I think I'm. Uh, I'm still quite optimistic, I guess. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah. So I'm optimistic from the point of view that uh, a few of these things we have mentioned today, drones, drone pilots, for example, metaverse, and my uh, past two years of research has been about autonomous vehicles and the built mm. environment. I think that this generates a lot of new intellectual value as well as new areas where businesses and governments can get additional value. Um, but on another hand, I'm concerned, of course, about where some of the jobs are going, how the inequality seems to be uh, getting even more stuck these days. So the haves have even more and the not haves are struggling even more. And so uh, maybe based on where I'm hanging around and moving around, I, I'm leaning on to the, the pessimistic side uh, because I, I I see quite a lot of people in the rental flats uh, areas um, that, mm -hmm. that seem to be um, not doing that well. In fact, if I just may add one more point, I think Suyong just sure. brought up one point which I just want to add on. Uh, and I think the, the inequalities that have and have not is very real, particularly in the metaverse, right? Because some of these metaverse platforms, they actually are pushing out cryptocurrency as support as the as a main form of transactions. And I think that is actually uh not so inclusive, it's more exclusive, right? So I'm mm -hmm. uh, actually more in favor of a digital currency approach as opposed to a cryptocurrency approach. Because digital currency approach is something we already have, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, we speak to the likes of like um the, the game developers, like for example, Sony PlayStation, Xbox, they really have 
currency uh, transaction, digital currency in place? Why do you need to have cryptocurrency? So those who are cryptocurrency, you know, advocates, sorry, don't, don't flame me, please. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably worth another discussion altogether. There was altogether, altogether, man. Yeah. There's a question here on, before we can go, if you would like to wait. Uh, do you think uh, AI will displace world order in education, work, lifestyle in the future? If it does, then we won't be around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rise of the robots. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. Nick Skylab, right? Suyong. Yeah. Uh, Nick Suyong, thank you so much for yeah, it's been a lively chat. I think a lot of things came up and certainly I think the new era of global development is really about new opportunities, new ways of looking at things, looking uh, at what could be rather than what isn't. Right. So there is some, you need to put on your optimistic filters on your glasses mm. if you're wearing them. And uh, let's keep an eye on the future and see what happens. Mm -hmm.